Welcome to Significant TV, Significant Stories by Significant Entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Fran McNeil, and joining me in the studio today is Jimmy Mac McNeil, founder of BDG Industries, short for Bulldog Bikes. Jimmy, welcome to the show. How <laughs> are you today? Thanks for having me. I'm sure. excellent. Sure, great. You know, this is really cool. Um, a lot of the show is really about family. Okay. My dad's in the studio, my cousin's in the studio, and now you're in the studio, another cousin. <laughs> um, so I, let's keep this a family <coughs> affair. Definitely. I'm glad to see that you're feeling well. I see the bulldog bike uh, tattoos on your arm. <laughs> uh, yes. Let's just jump right in. Why Bulldog Bikes? Where'd you come up with that name? Um, it came from um, a nickname I had <clears throat> years ago, which was uh, Jimmy Mack. Mm -hmm. And that came from uh, being in music and having an interest in music and being involved in music. And uh, as that grew, um, people were kind of comparing me to Mack Truck, Jimmy Mack, Mack Trucks. Um, then a high school teacher had a huge impact on me, and he used to, he was a Vietnam vet history teacher. And um, he used to, he had one arm, actually, mm -hmm. and he carried around a long stick in, uh, in history class, and he would say, he'd slap it on the desk, and he's like, the hungry dog always wins, McNeil. <laughs> and that, <clears throat> true story, and that hungry dog thing became my mantra, you know, because that's how basically what I've learned is like that's how he was getting through by motivating himself when he was being attacked and um, I just kind of like like locked into that and with a combination of eventually like when I was 18 I was in the studio they were like Jimmy Mac because I needed a nickname <clears throat> so it was like Jimmy Mac and then the Mac trucks and then um, I moved to New York <clears throat> and um, basically I got a job at a record label and uh, but I was still passionate about BMX from my career before moving to New York and um, basically um, we named the one company Bulldog Entertainment mm -hmm. and then after that had its time we had you know some major label deals with uh, Time Warner and Electra Records um, my real passion finally flushed out, which was the bikes and combining the music and the lifestyle and the culture to be Bulldog Bikes. Mm -hmm. But it came from really the experience of kind of having a Bulldog, you know, you're kind of nice but strong, you know, that kind of thing. I kind of had a similar personality to a Bulldog. And then that real saying, that hungry dog always wins. And it just really, there was nothing better than that Bulldog and, and to stay with it. So, you know, we had our music career and, <clears throat> and music behind the scenes and then got into the bikes again and then kind of combined all the, the culture mm. between action sports, music, and emerging culture. And that's how Bulldog started. Wow, pretty powerful. How about the biking in and of itself? How did that, how'd you get involved in that sport? I mean, a lot of young boys get involved in football and <coughs> baseball and basketball, right. but well, bikes? Yeah, I mean, the bike thing was very organic. I basically had an opportunity. Uh, we were, I lived in Philadelphia for a little bit um, from zero to five for me, and then we moved to the suburbs of South Jersey. And that opportunity to live down there opened me up to a lot of stuff I might not have been had access to in Philly. And um, basically, kids were playing soccer, football, baseball. There was sports all the time, but uh, <clears throat> the sport was really developing called BMX racing. And um, a kid, uh, Scott Lawson, I'll never forget, it had a magazine, I think fourth grade or fifth grade, and it was uh, called BMX Action. And I looked at it, and I was like, wow. You know, I saw the kids with the helmets and the gear, they're racing. And man, it just it just hit me, and I was just like, I want to do that. Wow, um, BMX biking. Yeah, so it was like BMX racing, and then uh, I did some research. I found out there was a track 10 miles from the house, mm -hmm. and I begged my father to take me out there and went out with one of my best friends, uh, Justin Phoenix. <clears throat> and my dad said, you're not going to race right away, but I'm going to take you to the track. Okay. And we went to the track for about a good year, and then he was like, so you want to race? And I was like, yeah. 
And then that's, I feel like my life changed at that point. I was an all-around athlete. You know, I played baseball, soccer, street hockey. I played pretty much everything on a high level competitive-wise, but there was something about the bike um, and everything that came with it that was as fascinating to me mm. and exciting. Mm -hmm. So what age was that where you were really kind of entering professional BMX right. racing? <clears throat> well, I started at 12 and then over like three or four years, it kind of happened quick. I actually started a team. I actually developed sponsorship deals. Like at that young age, I went around um, calling different uh, retail stores and I learned how to do you know, sales and business development <coughs> by trial and error. So I would call up uh, Video Conspiracy, was one of the companies, and uh, they were a video shop at the time. And this is like, uh, this is like the late, you know, early, like mid 80s. And uh, I'd be like, you know, I'm, you know, I have a bike team. Can you sponsor me? And they were like, well, you need to send a proposal. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> proposal. And then I would ask my mom what a proposal was. Right. And then, um, you know, then I would ask somebody, you know, another company, and they were like, you need to talk to our marketing department. I was like, marketing department, okay. So I would talk to the marketing department, and then one trial and error after another, I really got the whole sponsorship development game. And, um, and then started landing stuff, and then, you know, created this team, and the team, uh, we did some cool stuff for a couple seasons, and then uh, I got injured. Mm. And it uh, took me out. Uh, Real quick, well, my parents basically forbid me to ride. Hmm. And um, so from that, I got involved in some other stuff, but the secret passion was to get back to BMX. But the reality was I would have to leave home to do it. Okay. So when I naturally started my life at 20 and I moved to New York, I basically, once I got settled and I was doing the music business stuff as a job, um, I started, I brought all my bikes up, you know, because I was on my own. I could do right. whatever I want. <laughs> and, uh, and I started competing again. Okay. And that passion with the music and everything eventually led to Bulldog Bikes mm -hmm. and stuff. And, and you had a lot of successes with Bulldog Bikes. Yeah. I, I can remember one day hearing my parents talk about the fact that you were on the front cover of Black Enterprise magazine. Yeah. I was like, oh my goodness, I mean, that is big time. Tell yeah. us about that. How did that happen? <coughs> I, mean, I was actually living in London at the time. Mm -hmm. um, probably about five months before that, they basically wanted to do a story on me again. I'd been in there for all my different businesses through the years, the music mm -hmm. stuff. I'd probably been in there about eight times. Um, and got real close to uh, the BE team. But um, I never expected to ever get on the cover. I mean, I always wanted to get on the cover, but I didn't know when it would happen. <clears throat> and, um, and basically, um, they're like, there's an opportunity for you to get the cover, but you know, it's probably just gonna be a story. So I was like, cool with that. I was uh, living in London at the time for six months and uh, working on Bulldog, developing Bulldog in Europe. And um, I got a call where I was staying in London. They said, you got the cover. And I was just like, wow. And uh, what's powerful about that, that cover is, you know, one, uh, they never let anybody with sneakers on the cover. The only other person they let on the cover with sneakers was Russell. Ah, Russell Simmons. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, okay. And so I, I had Shell Top company. Adidas. Yes, Shell Top Adidas with my BMX bike doing a trick. It was still kind of urban, but suburban, and you know, it had a huge impact on BE because they were showing diversity in businesses and our culture. And you know, the cover was interesting because it's just like um, it's been a big, big uh, monument in my career. But it's interesting how it's kind of lasted and stuff. Like at first, I thought we were going to get tons of sponsorships. Mm -hmm. it didn't really happen that way. But what it did do was um, enforce our legacy mm -hmm. early, because I was actually probably one of the second or third youngest people on the cover. I got the cover at uh, 27, mm -hmm. so that was another thing. Um, and then the, you know they only put people either that are up and coming or you know are staples in our community. Right. So right. I was definitely in a good company and got on the cover before a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, that are in popular culture. 
So, um, you know, it's a humbling thing. Um, and, you know, I always wonder, I was like, how is this going to kind of feng shui <clears throat> in my journey? But it has definitely been unique how the cover comes up in meetings. Mm -hmm. It's kind of reinforced. It's not like a, when I go into advertising meetings, selling a sponsorship, it's not like a game closer. But I will say, like, it's just a powerful asset as we're showing some of the things that we've done. Mm -hmm. It's not a... It's not like the game changer where everybody wants to give us a deal, but uh, it was right. de it's definitely been a blessing and helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. Wow. You talk about journey, and journeys always have twists and turns, ups and downs, <coughs> mm -hmm. and challenges. People are, are made and defined by challenges. Talk a little bit, to the degree that you're comfortable, about a challenge that's happened recently and how you have incorporated um, your mindset in moving forward. <clears throat> yeah, most definitely. Um, over the last year and a half, excuse me, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I had uh, got diagnosed with kidney disease, which runs in our family and um, really changed my life, you know. And uh, I had to put a lot of things aside and put things in neutral. But uh, my philosophy of life, you know, is. Uh, you know, to take things to another level. So, you know, I went back to the basics and I really had to build myself from scratch. Mm -hmm. All the different personal things that happened to me around that time, financial, spiritual, I had to go back to basics, which I think, you know, the universe or God kind of wanted me to, to take a break. And the, uh, the inspiration and in some of the things while this year has been going on has been it's enhanced me in so many different ways because, you know, there's a, uh, some mentors <clears throat> used to say, you're going to sink or you're going to swim. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. not only is it a sink or swim situation, but it really tests you, can you rise? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, before that, you know, we got caught in the economy. My father got sick. I went through what I call a tsunami of challenges mm -hmm. that basically almost took me out, you know, at a certain point. And I had to fight that, and then two years later, that happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, throughout my career of 20 years, um, leading up to that point, you know, things were pretty smooth and steady, you know, mm -hmm. traveling around the world, doing my bike company, doing all the big X Games, do tour, all the things that kind of come with that, you know, the sponsorship deals, the collaborations with Toyota. Oh, so um, like Toyota. Right. And, um, but this has been a defining moment, which now kind of really makes more sense for me to go ahead in the future and, and bring <clears throat> this defining year. And it just, it's opened up a whole Pandora's box of great things, mm, you know? Wow. And, wow. Um, you know, so we're, you know, I'm in, you know, I'm in deep with it. Um, I feel like I've mastered it. You know, I have a high faith in God and uh, those those things have kept me going, but I'm in the one percentile <clears throat> of people on dialysis mm -hmm. that are living a vibrant life, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that um, I'm extremely fortunate and I keep pushing it. I said, mm -hmm. for a year, I'm gonna be a professional dialysis patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm gonna be the best dialysis patient on the planet. Wow, wow. So let's, we have about a minute left professional dialysis patient I'm not sure that's in the physician's protocol right really quickly define what that is and you've got a hat on mm -hmm. um, sort of talk about how that professional dialysis patient helps the hospital um, it helps the diabetes industry but mm -hmm. it also helps you <coughs> and connects with your marketing All yeah. in one minute <laughs> yeah no it's simple <clears throat> out of this came a movement crush the impossible do you have your shirt through, yeah your shirt? Okay. so <clears throat> it's kind of, it's uh, this is my mantra of getting through things and getting through, um, you know, any battle or any illness or any anything that you're trying to do in your life. Mm -hmm. um, crush the impossible. Yeah, crush the impossible. And I started from a tattoo. This is actually where I get my dialysis, but started from a tattoo. And um, basically uh, became the brand ambassador at the hospital of JFK Hospital for dialysis unit, the patient rep. And um, just basically combining all my passions of inspiration, uh, sharing knowledge, inspiring uh, other uh, patients and stuff, and you know, kind of uh, crusading just for 
you know, inspiration mm -hmm. and, you know, and more information, the better information you get, you know, you could be a better patient. And the professional dialysis thing is like me saying I'm going to be a professional baseball player. Mm -hmm. I was going to okay. learn it to the point that I could move on with my life where it wasn't becoming a primary situation that was keeping me under. Right. And that's <clears throat> what I meant. I was like, I'm going to master this and so I can have a vibrant life where most people in dialysis are taught you get that when you get the kidney. Mm, okay. And so I'm pushing the elements of a vibrant life, ha not having the kidney, mm -hmm. and working towards getting a kidney. Wow. You are always redefining. <laughs> uh, you are always redefining. You, um, I know on Facebook you talk about sort of the Jedi mm -hmm. and uh, crush the impossible, bulldog bikes. Um, I love what you do. Thank you, um, thank you, cousin. Uh, even though I'm your older cousin, <laughs> a lot of times I, I feel like your little sister. Uh, I look up <laughs> to you. Home. I love what you do. And thank you so much for being a guest yeah, on the show. Thank you, Fran. And and, and best great. wishes for yes. continued and, um, health. Everybody out there, support Significant TV, an amazing brand. Uh, this is Fran McNeil. She's the best. <laughs> Well, thank you. Well, thank you. And you are the best. You are the best. I'm so excited with the way that you, again, continue to find who you are and not letting your situation dictate how you're going to have that vibrant life. Yes. Well, folks, there you have it. Significant TV, significant stories from significant entrepreneurs like my cousin, <laughs> Jimmy Mac McNeil. <laughs> Join us for our next episode. Thank you.